Brandon. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I, I, uh, as soon as I was elected auditor, I immediately came here and got a couple of briefings from the Show Me Institute on issues that are important. And I read your literature all the time, and you've been a great resource for me uh, during my tenure as state auditor. Um, back in 1970, uh, the state auditor took on a new role. Up until that point, the auditor generally issued, when they audited a, an agency, a board, or a commission, about a two-page audit that was basically a financial statement audit. Or did the books balance is basically what happened. But Kit Bond was auditor back then, and he thought mm -hmm. we ought to do something a little more. We ought to be look for more accountability in government. We ought to do what are called performance audits and see if the government officials are actually doing what they're charged to do, not just if the books balance. And over the last 40 years, uh, there have been increasing uh, numbers of performance audits done. And in fact, now in all 50 states, the state auditors do performance audits. 38 of the states appoint their auditors or controllers, and in only 12 are they actually elected. Uh, but in all 50 states, they do performance audits. That means now that an auditor is no longer just an accountant balancing the books, but what we are is the taxpayer watchdog. We try to find fraud, waste, abuse, and corruption in government. But there is a limit on our authority under the Missouri Constitution, and it's very clear. What we look to see is if a person charged with expending public resources is acting, one, within their constitutional authority, two, within their statutory authority, three, within their regulatory authority, Four, are they following their own internal policies and procedures that they have set out uh, for themselves? And five, are they in accordance with sound business practices and published accounting principles? That's what we look at. So we will look to see, for example, if the Department of Insurance and Division of Finance is auditing banks and we go in to audit the Division of Finance, we, we don't decide, well, did they make a mistake when they said this bank was solvent or not solvent? That's way beyond our authority. We are not experts in banking. But what we will look at is, for example, they have a checklist of 15 items they're supposed to examine when they determine if a bank is solvent. What we'll look at is, did they look at all 15 items? And we'll report on that. So it, we try to have objective standards when we do performance audits rather than subjective standards. And we never tell the Department of Mental Health how to cure mental health or whether banks are healthy uh, or, or how to educate children. What we look at is are people acting within their authority and are they acting responsibly and according to sound uh, financial principles. The state auditor now has an expanding role. The legislature over the years has given us more and more audits to do. We now audit every state agency, board, and commission. So we'll look at the Department of Economic Development, the Department of Agriculture. We'll look at the various commissions for tax credits and the other, other areas. I'm actually sitting on a couple of the commissions, which is a conflict. We're trying to get that eliminated this year. Uh, and we also audit um, the 648 judicial circuits around the state. We audit the 89 counties that don't have their own auditor. We audit 522 school districts uh, around the state. Uh, and then we also audit elected officials, statewide elected officials, and we're about to release our audits of the Missouri House and the Missouri Senate. So it's a wide-ranging uh, list of authorities. The only area we don't have original jurisdiction over is, is political subdivisions. So if there's a fire district or a city where there's a problem, the only way we're allowed to audit those under the law is if there's a petition of the voters and there's a very set formula on how many signatures they have to have based on how many people in that political subdivision voted in the last gubernatorial election. But we do get a lot of petition audits. The city of Marshfield and Bolivar recently submitted, a Savannah up in northern Missouri submitted petitions, and when, once we verify the petitions, we actually put the petition audits at the very top of our list because that's direct representative democracy. That's voters who have gotten together. They've taken the time to get the signatures. They have grievances and concerns. Uh, and, you know, I will always go, or sometimes my deputy, but usually me, and personally deliver the results of those audits uh, at a town hall meeting. Uh, in a given year, we'll do anywhere between uh, 100 and 150 audits. Uh, we have 60 to 80 going on right now at any given time. Uh, and what we do is we have some that we're required to do by law and others that we do that I pick in our, dis in, in our discretion. I'll talk a little bit about some of those. So that's basically the overview of what the state auditor does. I thought since there's some people in the room, I might give a little background on how I got to be state auditor, and then I'll focus right immediately on some of the audits we're doing and things I think that might be of particular interest to what the Show Me Institute does, because I do read all your literature. I know there's a great interest in schools and tax credits and those issues, and I'll talk about what we're doing uh, in that area. I will say that I never in a million years thought that I would be state auditor. I'm, I'm from St. Louis County. I went to St. Louis County Public Schools, Clayton Public Schools. Met my wife, Kathy, uh, in seventh grade at Wydown Middle School up there. In fact, my son just graduated Wydown Middle School, and I had the honor of showing him the actual room where his mother and father met each other. He was 14. I said, Thomas, what do you think? This is where mom and dad met. He said, it's the most disgusting thing he's ever seen. Uh, typical, typical teenager. Uh, and, uh, 
uh, but, but my kids have gone to, to Clayton Public Schools. My daughter's at Mizzou right now. My son is at Clayton High School. Uh, as, as Brenda said, I went east, east to school and then came immediately back and started working at Bryan Cave. And as Brenda knows, and many other people in the room know, my area of legal practice was corporate internal investigations. And they almost always had an audit component to them. So I worked with accountants, financial analysts, did a lot of issues on cost mischarging, government contracts. But really what I did in the private sector ended up being very well suited for this job because it's remarkably similar to what I do as state auditor, which is looking for co corruption and, and, and abuse uh, in state government. Uh, as a, uh, Brenda said I was chief of staff to Jack Danforth on the Waco investigation and uh, and then when he became U.S. ambassador to the United Nations he called me from New York he had been sitting in a bulletproof car with John Negroponte in, in uh, downtown uh, Manhattan and Negroponte said you know the United Nations is kind of a hornet's nest it's very anti-American you got to really watch out and you've got to get a chief of staff you can really trust and it doesn't really matter what their background is just get somebody you can trust and Jack called me uh, at Brian Cave and, uh, and said, Tom, how would you like to be Chief of Staff to the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations? And I said, well, Jack, I don't know anything about diplomacy. And his response was, neither do I, uh, and we'll learn together. And so that's how I got into, uh, into the diplomatic world. I spent uh, time working for Jack as Chief of Staff there, and then John Bolton came, and you probably see him on Fox News a lot. He became U.S. Ambassador to the UN, and I thought he was going to throw me out. Most people bring their own chief of staff in, and he called me in his office and said, I hear you have an anti-corruption and anti-fraud background doing Waco and private sector. I said, that's right. I said, I would like you to be my United Nations anti-corruption guy. And that was during the middle of the oil for food scandal when Saddam Hussein was handing out bribes and kickbacks to UN officials and diplomats around the world. And so I stayed on and was John Bolton's chief of staff. And uh, we exposed uh, massive amounts of fraud and corruption at the UN and actually got an independent audit committee put in because of it. Uh, and I just continued the same sort of things I did at Brian Cave at the UN. And then, uh, <coughs> then a job opened up as deputy director of the law enforcement division of the State Department. Uh, and I was given that job. That's, as Brenda said, there's 4,000 people in almost 80 countries, $2.5 billion budget. And I literally found myself next, all, none of this planned, of course. I was in the jungles of Colombia uh, fighting the cocaine trade. And then I was in Guatemala City. We had an anti-gang program there multiple countries in Africa fighting kleptocracy of the dictators there, in Russia fighting organized crime syndicates, uh, and in the tribal areas of Af uh, Pakistan uh, trying to put in anti-Taliban programs. It was very, very exciting. Uh, but we focused more and more on Afghanistan because uh, uh, Afghanistan produces 90% of the world's heroin. Uh, it's almost a sole source supplier of heroin to the world. And it was a law enforcement problem, which was my job in the State Department, but it was more than that. Uh, the Taliban takes about a 10% cut off the top of the opium trade, and they were actually using the drug money to finance terrorist activities. And in fact, almost every major <coughs> terrorist group in the world now finances their activities with drugs. So I tell kids when I do anti-drug speeches, it's not just bad for you and a health problem, but you're actually financing terrorism when you buy these illegal drugs. And that's true. Hezbollah finances their activities with drugs. The FARC in Colombia finances their activities, and the Taliban does too. So we had the Taliban being financed by, by drug profits. Uh, President Bush also got some alarming statistics about how corrupted the Karzai government was by the drug trade. Uh, half the fields are controlled by the Taliban, the other half are controlled by pro-Karzai forces, and they also have been badly, badly corrupted by the opium trade. Uh, we used to go down and meet with police chiefs in remote areas of Afghanistan, and their salaries would be like, t in U.S. dollars, you know, 18 or $20,000 a year, and they'd live in very modest means. And then we go back to Kabul, and they're building a $3 million mansion in Kabul with fountains and, and, and plants and gardens and sculpture gardens and uh, very gaudy. We used to call it architecture because it was all, <laughs> all based on, uh, on drug money. Uh, and so the last, so it got so alarmed. Also, they were, they were growing dope instead of wheat. You could get 10 times the amount of money growing poppies you could for wheat. And so there was food insecurity in Afghanistan. It got so bad being a military problem, being a governance problem, being a food insecurity problem in addition to a drug problem that they uh, asked me, and this was a great honor, one of the great honors of my life, I was appointed the U.S. Ambassador for Counter-Narcotics and Justice Reform in Afghanistan and spent my last tenure with the Bush administration trying to root out uh, uh, the drug trade in Afghanistan, also helping them rebuild <coughs> their judicial system. So I got back to Missouri and I was teaching at, at Wash U and uh, one of the people in this room, Ambassador Burt Walker among others, uh, suggested that maybe I apply <coughs> those anti-corruption skills to my own home state. And that's how I ended up running uh, for state auditor. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to win and immediately got uh, into the office and 
found we have a, a great staff of about 120 people. Uh, many of them have been there back since when Margaret Kelly was auditor. Uh, they are completely nonpartisan. We operate a totally, I, I, I'm a conservative by nature, but the office is operated on a totally nonpartisan basis. So we never uh, go after anybody of any political party. And that's largely due to the fact of the balancing force of having auditors that have been there 20 or 30 years, that have been in Republican and Democrat administrations, they're a great group of people. But I did do some reorganization of the office. I hired Harry Otto as the deputy state auditor. Those of you who know Harry, he's one of the most respected accountants in all of Missouri. I'm a lawyer by background. He's an accountant. About half of the auditors since World War II have been I had a law enforcement background like I do, and about half have had an accounting background, but I wanted a deputy who was a respected CPA. He was the former president of the Missouri Society of CPAs, and so we put a really good person there. And, and, I, and I, 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 I polled the staff and I said, what are the problems in this office? How can we improve it? First thing they said is sometimes we get to an audit site and all the evidence has already been destroyed, particularly where there's fraud or embezzlement going on. We need to be able to get somewhere quicker. So I formed uh, the auditor's rapid response team. I hired a man named Daryl Moore, who had been the Green County elected prosecutor, a seasoned veteran prosecutor for, for 12 years, to be the head of my rapid response team. And now when we get credible allegations of fraud and combined with allegations that evidence may be destroyed, we come in the next day with subpoenas and we secure the area and we're able to find uh, the fraud. We've only, this is something you only exercise uh, under extreme circumstances. In two years, we've only actually authorized rapid responses twice. Once was in the city of St. Louis when there was an allegation that a, a principal was inflating attendance statistics. And this was a really sad story. You may have read about it. There was a lot of coverage around here. This was a very, very respected principal who had won a lot of awards, largely because of her ability to improve attendance among inner city school kids. Well, we had three teachers come to us and say, we fill out manual forms, and then she enters into the computer and changes them all. Uh, and she had gotten wind of this, and they were saying she's already going around gathering all the manual attendance reforms and trying to destroy them. So we went in, we secured the area. By the time we got there, two-thirds of the attendance forms had already been destroyed. But we were able to get one-third of them and found uh, a massive fraud going on. Uh, uh, dozens and dozens of examples of students who weren't even enrolled anymore, who were marked as present, students who were habitually late, who were marked as present, and, uh, and it, was, it, was, it was proven to be... Uh, that, that there was, you, you would look at the manual sheet and it would show the student was absent and you look on the computer record and said they were present the whole time and, and we were able to expose this unfortunate incident of, of fraudulently misrepresenting the improvement in the school. We, we audit a lot of school districts. I've made that one of my priorities is to audit school districts, but there has to be honest reporting. You know, you can't have good, you know, feel good stories that are not based on actual facts and that was one rapid response. The other rapid response we did quietly and so I can't tell you what it's about but you'll read about it soon. Uh, because we'll be issuing an audit, and in that particular case, we found blatant embezzlement, t tens of thousands of dollars stolen by an official, and we were glad. This was not anywhere near St. Louis. This was way outside of St. Louis, but we found that too. So we put a rapid response team in place in, because the career people said they thought we needed it. The other thing we found was that um, a lot of times we don't get to audit an entity until 10 years after we did it the previous time, and somebody will get a bad audit, and we'll go back 10 years later, and the same problems are in place. So I asked, what can we do to prevent people from just blowing off the audit, saying we're not, we're not going to do it? And what we decided to do was put in two new mechanisms. First of all, we now have a grading system. Everybody that gets audited gets an excellent, a good, a fair report. It's like a teacher, A, B, C, D. And we publish very objective criteria on what it takes to get an excellent. It's not me just sort of deciding, well, does it look good or not. Uh, it's very, we, we've never had a dispute in the office about whether somebody gets an excellent, good, fair report because we have very detailed criteria about how you get that award. But you can't believe, first of all, how much more cooperative the subject of the audit is when they know they're going to be graded. Uh, it's, a total, it's like night and day that the auditors have told me because now they know one of the criterion uh, for getting an excellent is you have to cooperate with the audit. Uh, and so they can't get the highest grade unless they cooperate and that makes them unbelievably cooperative. Uh, and, uh, and the other thing is we found that people were mischaracterizing our audits. So there might be one good thing in a terrible audit and the subject will say, look, we got a great audit, look what they said about us. Or the other way around, sometimes the political enemy of the auditee might take the one bad thing and say it was a terrible audit when really overall it was a pretty good audit and we prefer to give good audits rather than bad audits. So the grading system has taken all that subjectivity out of it and forced people to be cooperative with what we're doing in the audits. And that, that was another thing I did directly in response to what the career auditors uh, said we needed to do. And then finally, 
we put in the audit follow-up team. Now, you know, you don't have to have an IQ of 160 to think, well, if somebody gets a bad audit, maybe you ought to come back pretty quickly and see if they're improving. No one had ever done that before. So the same guy that does the rapid response team, my sheriff, I call him, he comes back. If you get a low fare, sort of a C minus or a poor on your audit, we are back in 90 days to do another audit to see if you've implemented those recommendations. And if you haven't, there's going to be another round of really bad press. And, uh, and I thought... I actually thought the subjects of the audit would consider that heavy-handed uh, and they won't like the idea of us coming back, but we found the exact opposite. Uh, for example, when we audited Pine Lawn, we found terrible problems with Pine Lawn. Uh, it, there were almost everything wrong that, that you could find, multiple findings, adverse findings, a misuse of money, a waste of money. And, uh, and the Post-Dispatch wrote an editorial after the audit came out and they said, it's hopeless, that city ought to just be unincorporated or combined with someone else. They always get a bad audit, they'll never improve. <coughs> And to our surprise, a couple of days later, an editorial of the city manager came in and said, no, uh, we are going to improve. And Auditor Schweik is going to do a follow-up audit. And we welcome that follow-up audit because you will see significant improvement 90 days from now when that follow-up audit came in. And then, lo and behold, they had implemented over 60% of our recommendations after 90 days. And I think they'll get the rest of them in soon. And we found that the, the subjects of the audit, when they get a bad audit, they actually want the follow-up because they want to show that they've been able to improve uh, the quality of, of their performance. So those were the things that we were able to do. Uh, we also do preventive work. Um, I, the, 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 some of the worst audits we do are sheriffs. They're law enforcement people. Well, I have a law enforcement background. I know you want to put the bad people in jail. You don't want to do paperwork. But we found terrible cases of missing money, uh, evidence not being handled properly in sheriff's offices. So this week, uh, I gave a preventive course to all the new sheriffs who were just elected, about 40 of them around the state, and said, here is how to get a good audit. And man, they were taking notes, and they understood, and then they realized that it could be very detrimental to get a bad audit. So we do preventive work. We, did, we released a paper called the 10 Steps to Audit Excellence. Here are 10 most common findings. And I go all around the state and deliver that to various groups, county treasurers, county collectors, whatever. Here's what you need to do to make sure you get a favorable audit because we really don't like giving out bad grades. I'm always happier when I give out a good audit. You don't get as much media. The media always wants to see a bad audit. But uh, when we give out four or five or six fairs or pours in a row, I'm like, wow, can't we find somebody to give a good or an excellent to? I think it's really, really important to do that. I think uh, out of the uh, 260 audits I've issued, I've only issued six excellence, but we've done a whole lot of goods. Most of them are either in the good or in the fair category, but we think it's improved uh, the way things have operated. Now, because I have a law enforcement background, I told the staff very early on I want my focus to be on, on the number one thing I want to find is if people are stealing taxpayer money, crime, embezzlement. That's my first focus. And we've been able to find now 12 instances of public officials stealing money since I've been auditor, and that's a record by far, and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, we have a whole series of fraud indicators <coughs> that, our, that our auditors are required to look at. So, for example, when they went into Schuyler County, uh, which is way up near Iowa, it's almost not even in Missouri, um, the collector there had not taken a vacation for 10 or 15 years. That's the first indicator, okay? Uh, if somebody's not taking a vacation, they don't want people to look at the books. We noticed there was no segregation of duties. She took the money in. She deposited it. She did the bank reconciliations. No oversight. That's the second thing we look for for fraud indicators. If number one and two are true, we look at is this person living beyond their means? Do they make $40,000 a year and are they driving an $80,000 car? We look at that. That was checked off. And then there's a series of things we go further and further and further down. And usually if you get to about number six or seven and it's all yeses, that person is stealing money. And it turned out this individual had stolen $570,000 over a 10-year period from one of the poorest counties uh, in, in Missouri. And sometimes these people, they get caught in their own world and they're so used to running their own show. After we confronted her with, look, you've stolen $570,000, she said, can we keep this quiet so I can get another job somewhere? That was our response. Uh, I'm not kidding you. Uh, and we said, no, we're reporting to the prosecutor, and she just pled guilty. Uh, we found, and, and it's amazing where people will steal money. A lot of times they think, for example, a circuit court. Cole County is the main circuit court in Missouri. That's where all the challenges to the constitutionality of laws are filed, right there in Jefferson City. We found two clerks embezzling money in the Cole County Circuit Court. They've also pleaded guilty. So you never know where the embezzlement will, will occur. Water patrol, someone was stealing fishing license money. It was only $3,000, but it was a public servant who was abusing, abusing the public trust. So I've made anti-corruption one of the hallmarks that I want to try to do because uh, obviously in the, the, you can find more examples of waste and more money in waste, and so we do a lot of looking into that. But I think the worst thing you can do 
as a public official is to steal taxpayer money. So that's sort of been my, my number one uh, priority in that situation. Um, we also look for, the next thing we look for are massive wastes of money. So for example, when we did uh, an audit of the Kansas City Public Schools, we found that we asked for inventory tags for all their computers. $2.4 million missing worth of computers, no record. I mean, these are things people can walk off with, laptops and, and uh, iPads and things like that. Uh, and, and as a result of our audit, they agreed to put tracking devices in now for all their electronic equipment. So if it's stolen, they can figure out exactly where it is and figure out who stole it. So we look for massive waste. This was not an instance of fraud. They just didn't know where it all went, and we were able <coughs> to help that. They also had given out $2 million worth of gift cards to students, and they had no record of who they gave them to or for what purpose. Uh, this was supposed to be a reward for academic excellence, but they couldn't even prove that they'd given them to the good students. So we said that needs to be improved. We did our statewide single audit, which is the audit of all the federal money that comes into Missouri. Uh, when you hear about our $24 billion budget in Missouri, you think that's Missouri money. Actually, only eight or nine billion of it is from Missouri taxes. The rest comes from the federal government. And we also audit all the federal funds that are coming into Missouri. And again, when the stimulus money came in, for example, and I operate a nonpartisan office, I think people know how I feel about the stimulus money, but we just wanted to make sure it was being properly spent. We found that state agencies could not even account for over $700 million of that money. We, they couldn't even tell us what, was, what they were doing with it. Uh, and so we reported that, and we found that to be a serious finding. We found that the Low Income Housing Energy uh, uh, Assistance Program, that the contractor that was uh, charged with giving that out, could not tell us what happened with over $600,000 of the money. And we think there will probably be an investigation of that. There may, that may be another embezzlement. So another really important part of our job is not only to audit the money that comes into the state from state taxes, but we are charged and legally required to audit all the federal money that comes in also. And that's actually our single biggest audit of the year. Usually we're auditing 14 to $16 billion worth of money. And every year we find amazing abuses of the program. This year we're going to look into, for example, the electronic benefit card, the cards they use uh, for welfare payments. We had some tips, and these have been made public, so I'm not revealing any confidential information, that some of those were being cashed in at Vegas casinos at the, at the buffet. Well, that's a complete illegal use of the cards, so we're going to be looking into whether there's fraud in that program too. So it's very important not only to look at the state programs, but the federal programs, because they account for more than two-thirds of the money that's coming into the state, and we look into uh, that uh, as well. I thought there were some audits I could talk to you about that are uh, of particular interest to this group. We audit tax credit programs, and I, I've read a lot about what you all do with tax credits, and again, I think pe some people in this room know what my personal opinion is on tax credits, but I really don't talk about it. Um, my job is to see if, if there is a tax credit program, is it being effectively used? Uh, so we looked at the quality jobs tax credit. You may have read about that audit. We released it about six months ago. This is a program that when it was formed, and it's had bipartisan support, uh, they claimed it would produce 45,000 jobs over about a 10 or 11 per year period. Well, that number was then reduced to $26,000, but when we actually audited the program, we found that it had only produced about 7,000 jobs. Uh, and yet they were still representing it as a 26,000 job program. And again, I'm not going to say whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, but we want people to have accurate information when they assess whether this program should continue. And I think we did the state of service by pointing out that the number of jobs that have materialized under that program are way, way less than were represented. Uh, the other thing we found is they, they, they depend entirely on the employers for reporting. There's no oversight. So even that 7,000 number is based on what the employers said they created in terms of jobs. There was very little activity, a little bit, but not much to make sure did they actually create those jobs or did they close one facility and fire a bunch of people and then open a new facility and then get the quality jobs tax credit. Well, really, it's a wash, but they created 100 new jobs here, but they lost 100 jobs there. There was not a lot of oversight to make sure that those types of issues uh, were looked into. We audited the Public Defender Commission. I know there's been some interest here on that issue. Uh, you know, a lot of the public defenders have now said that they are going to stop taking cases because there's an overload. And the Missouri Supreme Court held recently that the Sixth Amendment right to counsel does not require you get a public defender. It requires effective assistance of counsel. So if the public defenders are highly overworked, they can turn away cases because they won't be affected uh, in, 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 their, in their representation. They did not hold that, that, uh, that there's an, a unilateral right to refuse any case. So what we looked at was when they're turning away cases, is it based on objective data? Is, is there really evidence that they are uh, overworked? And what we found were huge flaws in the way they calculate their caseload and how much work that's going on. For example, 
Their standards for how many hours will be needed for a case were developed in 1973, and they haven't changed them. Now, think about the way a criminal case has changed since 1973. In 1973, if you had two or three people working around the case around, around the country, and you had briefs, you had to drive, you had to meet, you had to go with the hard copy of the brief, you had to retype the brief, you had to refile it. Everything can be done electronically now. You can't judge how, much, how many hours are going to be taken to do a murder case based on the fact that in 1973, all briefs were written and done manually, and people had to drive around to get them to each other. We have electronic communications now. There was no DNA evidence in 1973. That's one of the main ways, one of the main sources of time in a case. There was no way to calculate whether that's saving money or, whether, or saving time or, or costing more time. So we found that the first problem with the way they calculate their caseload is it's based on standards that are 40 years old, and they're completely irrelevant. Uh, the other thing we found was a huge mathematical problem. When they calculate how many hours they need to do a case, they assume an attorney is working 2,080 hours a year. When they calculate how many hours are available for a case, they assume an attorney is working 1,500 hours a year. Well, the, do the math. They'll always be overworked under that circumstance. And we pointed out that mathematical problem. So the result was, again, we don't take a position on whether public defenders are overworked or not overworked. But what we want is accurate data so that an accurate judgment can be made. And when the audit came out, to the credit of the public defenders, they asked for a meeting with me. They brought their lawyer in from Washington. And they said, we'd like to use your audit as an example of why we need some funding to get better and more reliable statistics. They concurred in the finding. They stopped refusing cases. You may have read about that. That just had a happened a couple of days ago. And that's based on the audit because there really wasn't objective evidence that they were overworked. They may be overworked. That actually may be true. But we said we're not going to give in. We're not going to agree to that assumption unless you provide much, much more accurate data uh, to prove that. Uh, a couple of other areas that we thought were of interest um, were on the... Uh, uh, the tax credit side, I'm going to do two new tax credit audits this year, which I think the Show Me Institute will be very interested in. The Brownfield tax credit. Uh, there have been a lot of allegations of misuse of that tax credit over the past few years, and we're going to do that. And then the low income housing tax credit is another one we're going to be looking at uh, very, very soon. Another thing I did, rather than looking at the tax credit program, I also looked at this past year at the Department of Economic Development's <coughs> due diligence process for awarding tax credits. Uh, and what we found was, uh, well, you always know there's a problem when, as soon as we started the audit, they revised their due diligence procedures. So that's a pretty good indication that they knew there was something wrong. But what we found was a very, very disturbing lack of due diligence. So, for example, in the Mamtech plant up in Moberly, where uh, tens of millions of dollars were lost because there was supposed to be, the Chinese were supposed to build a sweetener factory there, we found that very basic due diligence, diligence had not been done in that program. Uh, they hadn't looked at, for example, the person said he had access to $8 million in cash. They didn't ask, well, what bank is it in? Where is that cash? They just assumed that was true. Uh, there was no credit check done uh, on the history uh, of the company. Uh, they claimed that they had a, a functional plant in China. No one bothered to determine if that actually was true because there actually wasn't a functional plant in China. They claimed they had patents on a special sweetening product, but no one in that got a patent lawyer involved and said, are these really valid patents and are they for this product? Turned out it wasn't actually true. Uh, and uh, so they revised their due diligence procedures while we were doing the audit. But even then, we found, for example, a lot of shady companies are run by shady people. And when one company goes under, they form a different shady company. So what they hadn't done was looked at the financial background and fraud history of the principles of the companies. So even now, we've asked that they change that. Uh, one company may have no bad credit history because the people who are running it were bankrupted in four other companies previously, just not in this company yet. So we've actually asked that they significantly improve their due diligence procedures for awarding tax credits. Another thing we found is uh, problems with the stacking of tax credits. Um, a developer, if they can get all the tax credits lined up correctly, for every one dollar they invest in a property, they can get three dollars and twenty-four cents worth of tax credits. With the, and, then they can, and those are transferable. So they, they can rehab a building, get their $3.24, spend a million, get $3.24 million out of it. They don't have to have a single tenant because they can sell that tax credit to somebody else and make a huge profit. Now, sometimes those tax credits are sold at a discount, so they don't always get the whole $3.24 million. depends on when the tax credit is redeemable. But they'll still be guaranteed a profit regardless if they have a single tenant or created really much in the way of any kind of a job. So we ask that, that that be reconsidered as well. And hopefully with these audits, the legislature, which has been fairly inactive on tax credits over the past few years, will improve 
uh, the quality of those programs and reduce them if it's, if it's necessary. The last area I wanted to talk to you about before uh, I take questions is the initiative petition process. In addition to doing audits, my office writes the fiscal notes for any initiative petition that's going to go to the voters. And I want to give you some uh, background on that. The way it works is the petitioner, the one that wants to do the initiative petition, I know a lot of people in this room have been involved in those actually, they submit the language that they want to change the, the constitution or a statute to the Secretary of State. And the reason people want to do this usually is because they can't get the legislature to do anything. And you remember early on I told you that I really value petition audits because that's direct representative democracy. And I think initiative petition to the voters is the same thing. And they deserve a very, very uh, high level of deference. But it has to be done right. And there have been some problems with the process. Uh, what they do is they submit the, the language they want to change in the Constitution, the Secretary of State. And my office then has 20 days to prepare a fiscal impact statement. What we do is we send out an email to all state agencies or boards, and we also take unsolicited comments or analyses from any outside interest uh, lobbying group, special interest group that has a, an opinion on that. We often meet with them, and what we're supposed to do during that 20-day period uh, is come up with a range of the costs. So if this proposal is implemented, it could result in, for example, in increased revenue to the state of up to 10 or $20 million, or if, if, it, if it doesn't go well, it could result in a decrease in revenue of 50 to $100 million. The fiscal impact statement is very important because voters will look to see, is this going to cost the state money or is it going to help money? And often it will affect people's votes. So it's a very, very important uh, uh, process. But over the past 10 years, it, it's become almost a cottage industry for lawyers and lawsuits about these fiscal impact statements, as well as the actual ballot language that's been issued. Let me give you some statistics. In 2004, there were 16 initiatives petitions submitted to the auditor's office. Uh, two of them made the ballot, and there were no lawsuits about the language. In 2006, there were 41 initiative petitions, uh, four lawsuits, and three got on the ballot. In 2008, 55 petitions submitted, 11 lawsuits, and three got on the ballot. 2010, 105 initiative petitions submitted, 31 lawsuits, and three got on the ballot. And this past election cycle, uh, 100, my office received 146 <coughs> petitions to do fiscal impact statements. We were sued 50 times, uh, and only two made the ballot. So in 2004, there were 16 submitted, no lawsuits, and two made the ballot. Last year, 146 submitted, 50 lawsuits, and still only two made the ballot. That suggests to us the process is broken. We spend more time in court sometimes than we do doing audits. And so we've proposed some changes uh, to that process, which will make sure that frivolous initiative petitions are weeded out. Uh, one way to do that is, for example, to require a thousand sponsoring signatures. You have to go out and get a thousand signatures before you can even submit it. Uh, and the other thing we did is we took it all the way up to the Supreme Court on the challenges. My fiscal note is supposed to be upheld as long as it is fair and sufficient. We were sued uh, 50 times uh, last cycle. Uh, and one trial judge held that I didn't even have the constitutional authority to write a fiscal note. And another one held that I have to consider all data relevant to the fiscal impact, including data that is not submitted to my office during the 20-day period. Well, our point was, number one, clearly it should be constitutional. My authority is anything relative to the expenditure and receipt of public monies. Well, the fiscal impact of a ballot initiative would relate directly to that. And if I do have to consider information outside the 20-day period, it would encourage people who oppose the initiative petition to hold back information from my office. Then I issue the impact statement. Then they sue and say, well, he didn't consider all this information. So we took it all the way up to the Missouri Supreme Court, and we got a 6-1 favorable decision uh, and, and very broad language, which we were very pleased about, that said, a plain reading of the powers enumerated in this provision permits the auditor to engage in a review of past present and future receipts. It's clearly within his authority constitutionally, and he does not have to consider anything that is not submitted during the 20-day period. So the rules are now very clear. The opportunity to sue our office is drastically reduced, and we're hopeful now that with the new legislation that will weed out frivolous initiative petitions, and with the understanding that we have wide discretion in how we do this, that people will work with the system. So if you're involved in an initiative petition, I actually know there's some people in the room who are, rather than sue me, Come meet with me during the 20-day period. I never turn down a meeting. I will consider all of your data. It will be considered when we write the fiscal note. And it's going to be very, very hard to challenge the result of that fiscal note now because of the wide authority the Supreme Court granted us uh, in that process. I think that possibly the best part about being state auditor, well, I'll, I'll say two things. The first best part about being state auditor are doing some of the little audits that nobody hears about. 
So we get a petition from Clarksdale, Missouri, or Mountain Grove, or Indian Point, or Neosho. And we go in there and we do that audit, and we find significant problems. Neosho had $12 million worth of debt they didn't even know about. It. It's a small town, and they were underwater. Uh, Clarksdale had the same problem, several hundred thousand, tiny town, 400 people. Uh, and I, what I do when we're done with all this, I go into a town hall, probably a little bigger than this, 50, 100, 200, sometimes 500 people will show up. And I go through and say, here's what we need to do to get your community back on track. Gets no media, but the people are so happy. We've brought them back to solvency. Uh, their, their cities are back, uh, in several cases we can say, are really back on the road to fiscal health. And I think I get the most pleasure. You know, you, my audit of Governor Nixon gets a lot of press, but my audit of Clarksdale is the one that's in my heart. That's the one I really like to do because I feel we've really helped people. And then the second best thing about being auditors, I don't have to be a lawyer anymore. My friends like me a whole lot better. You know, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's funny because uh, uh, trial lawyers don't have the best reputation. I was, I was uh, having dinner with a friend of mine not too long ago, and he had been sort of through the ringer with the trial lawyers. A lot of bad things had happened uh, to him, and, and he was, we were at this restaurant, and he said really loud, he said, you know, Tom, the trial lawyers, they're a bunch of complete jerks. Uh, and he said it loud. So the guy at the next table leaned over and said, I resent that comment. And I said, well, are you a trial lawyer? He said, no, I'm a complete jerk. Uh, <laughs> that's the reputation that we have. And it's so nice to be away from that, at least for a while. Thank you for having me here today, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Yes, John. Uh, the question is that your department, before you got there, sounded like it was a mess. And who was, who was the auditor that failed to um, do that? i got to be careful here. Uh, uh, my predecessors were Susan Monty and Claire McCaskill and Margaret Kelly. And uh, a lot of, there were some really good audits that came out of those offices. But what I found was that it sort of had been on automatic pilot for a long time. And people hadn't thought of, uh, things have changed in state government. There's a lot more money around. There's a lot more potential for abuse. And all I did was poll the career people and say, how can we improve it? And the grading system and the rapid response team and the follow-up all came out of that. Yes? Uh, since we don't know who your successor will be, is there any procedure for auditing the Office of Auditor? Yes, that's a very good question because we do need to be audited. We are audited every uh, four years by the Missouri House and Senate, and that audit just came out recently, uh, and it was very favorable. And then we also engage in what's called peer review. I will send five of my auditors to Oklahoma or Massachusetts to do an audit of their office, and then they will send five of their audits to audit us. So we get audited twice every four years, and I'm happy to say we've had good, clean audits uh, both times. Good question. Yeah. Others? Yes. Yeah, Tom, uh, you, you've been great in auditing uh, the tax credit issues that Missouri has and maybe has more deeply than any other state. New York Times has just done a, a three-part series, a front-page series, an editorial in, in the New York Times today about tax credits, tax incentives generally. One, one aspect of this, and it's a key aspect in Missouri, is tax increment financing. And it's mostly at the local level, so you haven't done much in auditing yet. You, Mamtech, which you talked about, $35 million loss to the taxpayers. The Citadel, just one small project, supposed to be a small project, in Kansas City, $34 million uh, fiscal note uh, on a project that never was completed, never was even started. Uh, and convicted felons are getting uh, part of the $34 million from the city of Kansas City. Um, St. Louis City, St. Louis County, uh, Kansas City, Missouri, from an assessed value point of view, have diverted or debated more taxes than any other cities or counties, political jurisdictions in the United States. Mm -hmm. Can you audit the stuff at the local level? There are limitations on our authority. A lot of times it will require a petition. There's a political subdivision that's getting the tax credit. We do have authority to audit TDDs, Transportation Development Districts, and a few others. But it, one thing I'm trying to do, it's a good question because my authorities are very mixed. For example, I can audit any school district I want, but no fire department. I can audit state tax credits, but a lot of the local TIFs, I do not have authority unless there's a petition. One piece of legislation we have uh, pending, which we hope you'll all support, is to harmonize all of that and give me broad authority to audit, for example, all such programs. Uh, but right now, there are limitations on my ability to do those local programs, significant limitations. So in, in Kansas, I mean, I have a, I have a specific interest in this because I'm the director of the library in Kansas right. City, and, and our budget's being creamed by the 
uh, by the city in awarding uh, all, all, all this tax increment financing. Um, wh what kind of a petition do we need? How many signatures do I need? To well, it, it, it's, a, it's a sliding scale, and it's based on the size of the political subdivision that's at issue, the percentage of people that voted in the last gubernatorial election. And it can be 8%, 10%, 12%. And what we can do is if you tell us this political subdivision, we can assess how many people are in it, and we can send you the exact number of voters that we need to sign. You know, we found that some people, uh, this happened in Rockwood and a couple other places, when they hear they have to do a petition, they throw their hands up, we can't do it. But really, the threshold is not that bad. If, you, if there are some resources put behind it, uh, usually you can get the number of signatures necessary to the petition. If you'd like to contact the office, we can give you all, all the information about that. You might like to know the TDD that was just created for uh, Kansas City to, to uh, build the trolley mm -hmm. uh, was, was deliberately created so that it would be fewer than 1,000 people voting in the TDD election uh, to commit $200 million of the city's money. Wow. Know? Now, that is something I do you have the authority you might want to audit. That one. Yeah, I do have the authority to audit TDDs. But it's a very... The, the legislature over the years has given us different authorities and different bills, and no one has ever, you know, because it's one legislature and then 10 years later it's another one, no one has made an effort to really harmonize and say, what should the auditor really be doing? Why would the auditor have the authority to do this and not that? And that's one of our areas, particularly in local government and political subdivisions. There's a move right now, for example, to give us authority to audit museum districts, which we do not have the authority to do. Uh, and there's been a lot of controversy about museum districts. Uh, and, uh, and we have no ability to audit those, those museum districts right now. Other questions? Yeah. Couple of things. Given the big election that, that, that resulted in the police department coming back under the city of St. Louis, mm -hmm. when was the last time the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department, which until recently was a state agency, when were they last audited? And when was the last time the city of St. Louis was audited? The Board of Commissioners, we audit every couple of years. We just did the Kansas City Police Board, and we'll probably do the St. Louis one soon. Um, the city of St. Louis was last audited by a petition audit. They got a number of signatures for the whole city. About two to, the, I think the audit started three years ago, and the results were released two years ago. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Tom, I wonder if, um, with your department, if you have a figure like the amount of money that was saved, and or how much fraud you caught, or is, is there a way to um, numerically demonstrate the results? That's a good question. When it comes to embezzlement, we can identify exactly, because we know, we, we know exactly how much money was stolen. So for example, in the first years, I think we found $1.4 million worth of embezzled money. When it comes to other things, it's hard to say. So we found $700 million in untracked stimulus money. It doesn't really mean it was wasted. It just means no one could tell us what was being done with it. So that becomes harder to determine how much money we saved. Uh, so we try to keep some metrics, but in some cases, just by the nature of the audit, it would have to be an estimate, or we can't say for sure how much money we save the taxpayers. Uh, again, uh, uh, sometimes it's prospective, too. So, for example, with the gift cards, that money was all out the door, the $2 million in Kansas City, the gift cards, but they discontinued the program after the audit. So we knew we saved money going forward. We just don't know how much money we save. So, Tom, when you find, like, there's that large sum of missing stimulus money, is that the end of it? It's missing? We don't know where it went? What are the consequences? Well, what we do is we issue the audit, and then they immediately run to try to show us how they, how they handled the money, and that's what happened. Some of this money was in the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and they said, oh, it's all been very well spent. I said, well, you can't show us where any of it was spent. Well, we, our reporting has a one-year lag time, and we're like, well, if there's a one-year lag time, it's too late to fix anything that's wrong, because by the time you tell us what happened, it's already been spent. All the money's already been spent. So they've agreed to revise those and not have the one-year lag time to let us know further up front. We always try to find a constructive solution to those problems, but that, that was one example of how that worked. Yes? Uh, Missouri Technology Corporation invests in small startup companies. Mm -hmm. Does anybody of your group ever look to see whether any of the investments pay off? We are going to release our audit of MTC in about three months. Okay. Yeah, so we're looking into that right now. Good question. Uh, how, how would an individual know what your results were? Oh, that's a good question. Well, www.auditor.mo.gov has every audit published on it when it comes out. And we try for the, for the bigger, more, more uh, publicly visible ones like that one to do a press release and a press conference. And there'll probably be some media about that. But you always can look at any of our audits on our website, uh, auditor.mo.gov. They're always posted there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, you, you said you like to do performance audits. and. Um, and also that we get a fair amount of federal money. Every time you get federal money, it comes with requirements and reporting and all right. that stuff. Do any of your audits look at the cost of compliance for accepting that money and say whether that was a good... No, we don't. We don't. And the reason we don't is that the, the federal statute that requires we audit that money, that's not 
needless to say, they don't want us looking at that. And so I don't have any legal jurisdiction to do that, unfortunately. I'd love to be able to do that, but, but I don't. We don't, because obviously the cost of regulation is one of the biggest business killers there is, but they don't allow us to look at whether their regulations are right, only whether our people are complying with them. Yes? Tell me the, 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 the audit website again. You mentioned uh, www.auditor.mo.gov. Auditor.mo.gov. And that, we, we keep them on the website, I think, back 10 or 15 years. So you can look at almost anything we've done for a long time. Any other questions? Tom, thank you so much. Thank you for much. having me. I enjoyed it. <laughs>